traditional airway management training, a plastic head on the table or a mannequin on the hospital bed. How far is it from pre-hospital environment when your patient is in confined space, challenging environment and you actually need to manage his airway? Actually, I had to manage my first patient's airway in the tank. Why not to do it again? My name is Alex Hepner and this is Group Call. What is the most important element of the airway management? You may say equipment, yeah, you're right. You may say PPE, you're also right. But I've learned that the most important element of your airway management is always a good plan B. So awareness what to do when things will go south. Okay, so if for any reasons uh, postural drainage is not enough for you if suction unit won't do the trick uh, now you have to actually use OPA or Gedel if you like two ways of measuring first um, from hard to hard so from mid incisors to the angle of the jaw that's the first one the second is soft to soft from the, from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe um, the first one is more accurate, so I would say use the first one. Now, um, you insert the OPA all the way around, like upside down. As you can see, this bit acts as a tongue depressor, and halfway through, you twist OPA and it sits nicely uh, just above the epiglottis, and it keeps the tongue um, away from the back of the throat really good um, adjunct i really like it uh, the problem is that it triggers the gag reflex so please do not do not use it in in um, semi-conscious patients because you can trigger a massive uh, gag reflex now uh, people tend to say that if you don't have a correct size opa it's better to use uh, a bigger one than a smaller one mm, not really you can actually trigger the vagal nerve with too big OPA. So if you don't have a correct size OPA, I would use something else. This something else can be NPA, nasopharyngeal airway. Um, how to measure it? You try from the nostril to the earlobe. You have to pop some lube on it, not too much, and don't put any lube on the tip of the device start with the right nostril as it is physiologically bigger and what i've learned working on icu is that if you will gently press the tip of the nose um npa will actually go a bit easier gently gently wiggle it all the way down perfect and now you can see how nicely it sits uh, what i like about npa is a it won't uh, trigger the gag reflex and if you need to actually perform nasal intubation um, NPA uh, will will do its trick and will keep the, the the nasal way open for you. Next step on the airway ladder, IGEL. I really like IGELs. They are simple. They are weight related, so you can see patient's weight is here, and all you have to do is pop some lube on the cradle here, and just gently lube your IGEL like that. Again, you don't want too much lube here. And then open the patient's airway and push the idle up to the moment when you can feel resistance uh, and it sits and it sits nicely. Um, how deep it needs to go? So first resistance you will feel is from tonsils, the second resistance that would be the idle sitting where it should sit. Um, additional thing, you can see a, uh, a marker on the bite block. A marker is here. So patient's incisors should be more or less on this marker. So again, open the airway, insert an idle, and it sits nicely. Okay, so here we have our patient in confined space. Uh, let's think how can we uh, secure the airway. Um, now, if the patient is unconscious, you may use OP again, measuring from heart to heart, so mid incisors to the angle of the jaw, um, inserting 
twisting and we've got OP in play. If your patient is unconscious and you think you may need to intubate them and you won't have a nice space, uh, you may use NPA, so again measuring from the nose to the earlobe, um, putting some loop, not excessive loop, um, on the device, uh, avo avoiding the tip of the device, gently press the tip of the nose, bevel towards the septum and wiggle it all the way down. And that's hopefully should do the trick, OP and NPA. If not, you can step up, just remove the OPA and prepare the eye gel. Eye gel should be lubricated. Again, not excessively. Gently, gently open the airway and shuffle the eye gel down. Perfect, it sits nicely. I feel resistance now. Uh, three mandatory checks you have to undertake after inserting the eye gel. So you want to see chest rise and fall after ventilating. You want to actually auscultate uh, the chest. And last but not least, you want a capnography. You want to see a good, nice waveform um, capnography. Now, how to hold eye gel in place, how to tie the eye gel off. Uh, I use two knots technique, which is quite robust. Uh, going from the, starting from the back of the head, you want to go to the top of the eye gel. You want to make two knots here, and the second knot. Now around the eye gel, you want to make one knot and second knot. Yes, it's a lot of fluff, but it is a robust technique and eye gel sits nicely even if you need to extricate your patient from confined space. And we know that we need, we will need to, we will need to extricate this patient soon. So here you go. Two knots technique and the agile sits nicely and uh, it's secured. Now, if you need to intubate, uh, please remember to pre-oxygenate your patient. Uh, so leave the NPA in situ. Remember about good CE grip. And now you want to ventilate. You do not squeeze your back too strongly. Do not squeeze your back too strongly because you may actually create a pressure that will open the esophagus and the air will go to the stomach and you don't want that. You don't want regurgitation. So which bed to use? Normally uh, with emergency services, uh, we use Macintosh blades. Uh, sometimes on theaters you may see Miller's uh, blades. Uh, they are in different sizes as well. Um, I don't have a proper long Miller, but actually if uh, you uh, ask anesthetist uh, what they use for challenging airway, they would say big Miller. Give me, give me a big Miller. Um, but let's say with Macintosh blades. Now checks you should undertake before the shift is of course um, is your laryngoscope uh, operational? Can I see the light on the end of the blade? Uh, if yes, that's amazing. Now, tubes, different sizes. Uh, I usually use uh, seven for male patients and uh, six for female patients. Now, also remember to loop the tube. How to do it in a nice and clean way. Here you go. You can squeeze some loop here. And now, your tube is lubed and still clean. How to hold the laryngoscope? Don't hold it like that, because you, you, can, you can actually create a trauma in, in, in mouth. I would say hold it like that with the thumb, with the thumb creating, with the thumb like a part of your laryngoscope. Um, open the patient's mouth with the scissor technique and move the tongue from right to left, like that. Hopefully, you can see, you can see the cords, and now the tube is past the cords. Perfect. Close the laryngoscope. Tube is in. Do not over inflate the balloon. Anything between seven and ten milliliters will do. If you will over inflate the balloon, um, you may actually create a pressure sore on in the inside of the trachea. So I will do seven mils. 
it's good to check the balloon itself for numbers. Uh, sometimes manufacturer will leave the number here, we'll, we'll put the number here, and then you know how many mils you need to inflate the balloon. Okay, the last thing is intubation, is a nasal intubation. You have to lube your tube, uh, pre gently press the tip of the nose, insert the tube till you will feel the resistance. Now, all you need is a good laryngoscope. Remember, do not put any pressure on the teeth. And the muggle forceps to actually pass the tube down between the cords. When you use nasal intubation, when you cannot really manipulate the head, when you don't have enough um, space to see. Okay guys, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call. Thank you.